so good afternoon, everybody. We will start today. Uh, we will continue today on the lecture about sources of demographic information. And my idea is to finish this uh, lecture here and then show you some examples of um, places online, place online resources where we can get demographic information for free. All right, so there's a lot of websites and I listed a, a bunch of them at the bottom of our course website and I'm gonna show some of those. So in the last class, I was talking about the difference between the styles of censuses between countries across the world. So some countries, when they go to a household and they interview the people there, they ask where the person was living exactly at a specific uh, date of reference, right? So, and those, uh, those censuses that ask the question about where the person lived exactly at that census date, or here in the US called census date, in other places called date of reference of the census, those are the dual censuses. Censuses that don't actually care about it, they just go to the household and ask how many people are living here today, right now. It doesn't matter if it's April 1st, it doesn't matter if it's May, June, whenever, the person arrive at those at that household. Uh, the interviewer we will ask questions about that specific household at that specific time. Those censuses are called de facto censuses. The de facto censuses they are cheaper, and it's easier for the person being interviewed to remember to exactly answer how the household is at that specific moment in time. And for the interviewer, it's easier to find people at that specific moment in the present. So if, if we're talking about census that has to count everybody and I get in someone household after April 1st, and let's say that I reach that household only on April 17th, and then I ask the people, where were you living on April 1st? How many people were living with you on April 1st? What were the ages of people on April 1st? You have to answer the questions all about April 1st. So there, it can have, it demands more training from the interviewer because the interviewer has to make clear that those questions relate to the census day. And, um, and it also for the interviewee. So you could have some more measurement error in those censuses, right? But that's why we need a lot of good training when we implement in censuses. The, um, this, in the course website, in the course website, under this lecture, we are on the lecture about the sources of demographic data uh, theories, the source of demographic information. So that's the lecture I'm showing you right now. This report from the United Nations, uh, I just like that it. it's an, an old report, but and if you just click here, you have you have access to this PDF file. I just like it because it makes that same um, distinction between the de facto and the, ju the jure censuses. De facto, population consists of all persons who are physically present in the country or air at the uh, reference date, whether or not they are usual and or legal residents. The de jure population counts of all usual residents, whether or not they are present or in or legal, it's related to the person, to the uh, residents, and to the characteristics of the household at the date of reference. See here that the UN uses that term, reference date, or date of reference of the census. In the US, the term that is usually mentioned by demographers is census day, which is April 1st. And in this table here, in this report, it shows the countries and whether those countries have a de jure or de facto census. And you're gonna see that exactly usually developing countries that it would be too expensive to find people, to get information of people at its exactly date of reference. Most of those are de facto 
censuses, except in developing countries. And if you keep going, you're gonna see here, Canada, the jure, as I mentioned before, and the US, the jure as well, right? And Brazil is also the jure, and the date of reference in Brazil is, well, I think it's July 31st, but in the US is April 1st. So the date of, oh yeah, it's right here, it's written here. No, it's August 1st. So Brazil is August 1st, the US April 1st, right? So these are the date of reference, or let's say they use the same jargon as in the US, those are the census days in each one of the countries, okay? So Brazil, for example, August 1st, the US, uh, April 1st and Canada, May 15th, okay? So that's what it is. So just continuing here, what is the main reason? What is the main goal of us collecting the censuses? And here I'm gonna start focusing a little bit more in the US case as well. So the general justification to have census across the world is to collect data about the population so we can understand issues that the population is facing and we can implement public policies to uh, improve the quality of life of those people. The, the census, can one second, I'm just going to mute myself here a little bit. So we can collect data about the population, know the issues that that population is facing, and we can implement some public policies. The, in the case, and we can collect information about crime, death rates, income, and we can get that income and divide by the total number of residents in the household, so we can have income per capita. And, this data can be analyzed by the government in order to implement public policies, but it can also be used by private companies because if a private company is considering opening a business in a specific city or county, with that data from the census, we they have a better idea of the demand for specific products depending on the social, economic, and demographic characteristics of the population. We can estimate information about the households, cohabiting households and same-sex households. We can collect information about fertility. We can collect information about mortality, migration, and so on. In the US specifically, the principal reason uh, or just justification for the census is actually written in the US constitution is to provide population counts to be used for apportionment a portion, apportionment of the House of Representatives. I always get stuck in some of these English words. So the main idea, what's the main reason here for the US to have the census is to count the population. So we will know how many representatives from each state will be, uh, what the number of representatives from each state in the House of Representatives based on the size of the population. So the number of representatives in the House uh, varies every 10 years, exactly depending on the result of the census, right? Because of that, there is a lot of, there are a lot of controversies and really heated debate about how to properly count the American population, exactly because the number of people living in each one of the states that will tell us how many representatives each one of them will have at the house. And here in these next slides, I'm gonna tell you some of these controversies and issues, problems that we have been facing more recently. So, the 2020 census, first thing, it uh, got delayed and it got compromised 
because of the pandemic. The current pandemic delayed the activities of the 2020 census that was in the field last year. And the federal government, the previous federal government, the government that was in charge at the time of the 2020 census, decided to end activities of data collection by September 30th, 2020. And the problem with that is that it could undercount the number of people in vulnerable groups, such as minority groups and people in rural areas. So there was a lot of criticism about that decision from the federal government, from the previous administration, because they were saying, if those people that are hard to find, you don't find them, you're not going to count them, and that's going to uh, bias how many people you count to uh, in the population of that state and then it's gonna affect the number of house representatives from that state. And the main argument is that these uh, more vulnerable populations, these minority groups, they tend to vote more Democrats. And if you count them less, then the population uh, on states that, are, that tend to be more Republican would be better counted and that would favor the apportionment of the house for these coming years. So that was a main criticism about that decision. And because of that, uh, Senator Schatz and uh, Murkowski, they, um, in, they suggested this act, the 2020 Census Deadline Extensions Act, that pretty much required the Census Bureau to continue the field operations data collection of the 2020 census until October, not only until September, a full month more, which would give the census more time to collect and process data, leading to a more complete and accurate count that we would be able to access more minority populations. And I propose the extension of the deadline for delivery of apportionment data to the US House of Representatives from last December 31st to April 30th this year, 2021. And it extended the statutory delivery of redistricting data to states from March 31st to July 31st. So it gave more time to the Census Bureau to collect data, give more time for the Census Bureau to refine their data, uh, properly count how many people are in each state and send that information into the House of Representatives and give more time too for the Census Bureau to give information to the states. So the data here is the Census Bureau giving the data to the House of Representatives in DC. And here they are giving data for the states. So they give more refined data within states, how many people live in smaller areas, in the congressional districts. So the congressional districts could be redrawn as well. And I'm gonna talk more a little bit about congressional districts in the following slides. But the main idea is that the census was facing these issues because of the pandemic. And this decision, Many people were mentioning that it was uh, being done to favor the Republican Party. And the interesting thing is that this act was introduced by Senator Schatz, the Democrat, and uh, Senator Murkowski, a Republican. And this data, this information I got from this website here, that's not information that's available, of course, in the course textbook, which was published in 2017. So another issue is related, was related to the citizenship question. The census, I showed to you the questions that are asked in the census, that short form, that are the questions that are asked to everybody in the population. It's pretty much um, relationship with the head of the household, age, sex, race, ethnicity, uh, 
and also whether the household is rented or not. There is no question about citizenship. And the US Constitution mentions that we should count all population in the US. It doesn't matter if they are citizens or not. The whole count of population should be used to distribute representatives to, to the house. And the previous administration was trying to include the citizenship question into the census. The citizenship question is asked at the American Community Survey. So the American Community Survey that happens every year and it has a longer questionnaire does ask the question about citizenship about for people, whether people are uh, born in the US, if they were naturalized, or if they are not known citizens. We have that information, but that information is not in the census. And that information is not capturing whether people are documented or undocumented immigrants. It's just asking if they are citizens or not. A lot of these non-citizens, they, they might be, they could be here working properly. They have a work visa and everything or green card, but they are not citizens. And the argument of those that were in favor of including the citizenship question in the sense is that oh, we should count citizens in order to distribute the representatives in the house. But that's not what the constitution mandates. And the counter argument was that, oh no, you guys are trying to implement this question about citizenship exactly to make people less likely to answer the questionnaire if they are undocumented immigrants or they might be documented, but they have relatives who are undocumented and that would undercount the population exactly in those minority, more vulnerable populations. And always Republicans deny that. And it's interesting, this article that came out just in May, 2019, uh, Thomas Hofeller, he was a strategist for, for the Republican party. And after he died, his daughter, she released a bunch of notes and data that was in his computer. And they, those notes show that actually Thomas uh, Hofeller played a crucial role in the previous administration to add the citizenship question to the 2020 census. That is a citizenship question to the census would allow Republicans to draft even more extreme gerrymandered maps to uh, affect uh, Democrats. So we would have fewer representatives elected from uh, Democrats. So the interesting, what is this gerrymander? The thing here is that counting fewer people that are more vulnerable, it would undercount areas that usually tend to be more Democrats, and that would affect the number of representatives in the House from those states that would be more affected. But it would also affect how the congressional districts are drawn within states to elect those House representatives. And in his notes from Hofeller, he wrote the key portion of a, uh, a draft. Uh, the, the, the Justice Department actually used afterwards to say that this citizenship question was actually a way to enforce the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So the letter that the Justice Department from the Trump administration used to justify the inclusion of the citizenship question was actually drafted by Hofeller. So there is a lot of political game going on when we are doing this. What's a major issue of trying to answer and add the citizenship questions? Like I just said before, if I go into a household where there are undocumented immigrants, and I ask that question, people might get 
might not answer that question at all, or might refuse to answer the question all, uh, at all. Don't answer any of those questions, so you would compromise the whole, the whole census. Or in households where we do have documented and undocumented immigrants, even the documented immigrants would say, no, everybody here is a citizen. And then that question itself would also get compromised, or they could also refuse to answer the census. Just by having that debate about the inclusion of the citizenship question, the national arena, already compromised the census. Like demographers were discussing that in the conference of the Population Association of America, that just by having that debate, that discussion in the media, people would already be less likely to answer the census. So that already compromised in some other way, the quality of the 2020 census, okay? And what is this? Are these gerrymandering maps that I mentioned here? So this issue of political gerrymandering, state legislators draw congressional district boundaries to favor specific political party. And gerrymandering is against the law. Unless topography gets in the way, districts are supposed to be more contiguous areas. And this geographer, uh, Alas de Array, he built maps of all 435 congressional districts. So you could see how awkward some of them are. And that's a really sign that specific state legislators were trying to draw these congressional districts in a way to favor the party that was in control of that specific uh, state legislator. Okay. One clear example is in North Carolina. A Republican draw legislative map packed African Americans and Hispanic voters who usually tend to vote more Democrats in too few districts. So the state legislator, legislator in North Carolina, which was in control by the Republicans, they draw the congressional districts in a way after the 2010 census that put together no African Americans and Hispanic voters. So they would elect just one um, representative to the House or even to the, to the state. And just to give, just to explain in 2010, in 2010, the congressional districts were based in the 2000 census. Democrats at that time won the popular vote. And they, were, they won seven seats in the state delegation, House delegation, and Republicans won six seats. By 2012, in 2012, the congressional districts were already redrawn based on the 2010 census. Democrats again won the popular vote, but exactly because that state legislator had redrawn the maps, putting together African-Americans and Hispanics uh, in specific areas, even though Democrats won the popular vote, Republicans won nine representatives and Democrats only four. So we are talking about census, we are talking about demography, we think we are talking more about uh, technical decisions, but Politics play a major role here, and we should not um, forget that. And usually these changes are done using technical terms, but we have to go deep to understand what is going on. That's why, going back to my slides, when Thomas Hofeller died and his uh, notes became public by his daughter, we got to know the reality of the reasons that the citizenship question was going on. Although all those reasons were being denied by the previous administration, okay? So it's just all these interesting ways that we have, you get to know about why some of these decisions are done. And just to show you here, this is exactly the example from 
uh, the state house delegation being elected in North Carolina in 2010 and 2012. Both years, Democrats won the popular vote. In 2010, Democrats had more uh, state uh, delegates elected. So it was seven against six. And again, in 2012, Democrats won the majority, but Republicans won nine delegates. So they won the majority. And you see here, for example, this district, how awkward this district is in North Carolina. It's a place, it's an area that's going all over the state. And the main argument here, or the main criticism here about this area, is that actually capturing all African Americans and Hispanic population all together, and they would elect just one representative. But of course, that area already had a weird shape even before redrawing the districts after the 2010 census. Because this is before the use of the 2010 census. So that specific district is exactly the, the 12th congressional district in North Carolina. And this slide here showing the evolution of that district until reaching this, this form here, which is this one here, okay? It's just to show how weird the shape was getting. And again, gerrymandering is an issue, it's against the law. If this area is being drawn because of trying to put people with like certain, from certain race ethnicity groups, in that those areas, and that's not being related to topography, as I mentioned. In specific case of North Carolina, in 2016, uh, North Carolina lawmakers were ordered by the U.S. federal court to redraw the 20 state uh, House and Senate districts because the map was considered unconstitutional gerrymander because it was taken into account distribution of the population by race ethnicity. In June 2019, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it's not the job of federal courts to decide the boundaries of states. So this federal court said, yeah, the state should redraw. They appealed, and then the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, federal courts should not deal with this issue. That's a state issue. But then in September 2019, finally, a state court considered the maps is an unconstitutional partisan uh, gerrymander in order lawmakers to draw the maps again, right? So all those issues are going on all over the, all over the country. This is one example uh, in North Carolina, okay? In Texas, for example, um, this, uh, the district, that's the, the second district, and uh, in the 114th Congress, it had this in shape. But one thing that's also highlighted, and again, this data here that I'm getting is from other sources, it's not in the textbook, is that some of these shapes might look weird. But if, for example, here, this district is formed by people that live in similar suburban areas of Houston, that would make sense. That we are uh, putting together a, uh, um, a neighborhood with similar socioeconomic characteristics, but that decision should not be done based on their race ethnicity. That's the main issue. In Michigan too, it's interesting how uh, the congressional district where Flint and Detroit are elect Democrats, but exactly because the way that the districts are, are divided there, more representatives from Republicans are elected. Okay, even though maybe in some cases, and of course the population, we have a, a bigger population, larger population in Detroit and Flint than in these other areas. Okay, so that portion of the lecture was about 
the census is. And just to show you that the census it's, does not only bring technical demographic debates into account. A lot of those debates about how to include questions, count population, and in the US is a really clear case, is driven by political decisions. As I mentioned to you, the census is, you collect the census in a specific time period, the last one in 2020, over a specific amount of months, but always collect information about people of when they live and how they were in April 1st, the census date. And this data is called period data because we get information about one specific year. And I also mentioned that that data is cross-sectional. It's the data about the population in specific uh, time period. Another source of really important demographic um, data are registration systems. Registration systems, it's pretty much the collection of data from, I mean, we, whenever we talk about registration systems, we think about uh, birth certificates, death certificates, or any other form of register about the population that's collected in more a regular basis, not just in a specific time point. So what exactly is population register? is a national list of persons with their names, addresses, date of birth, and person uh, personal identification numbers. Vital statistics are data from civil registration systems, as well as from actual records of vital events. So that includes birth certificates and death certificates. In the whole world, we have all these different uh, ways uh, in which uh, birth and deaths are reported in a specific country. And still, a lot of countries, you know, of course, developing countries, have many babies that are born, but they are never registered in the national system. So, for example, the UN estimates that in 2013, 57 million babies were not registered, actually, in 2012. The percentage of children under age five, there were a total of 230 million unregistered children exactly around that same time, 2012. Although 90% are registered in more developed countries, less than 20% are registered in Sub-Saharan Africa. So you might have cases in which babies are born, they die before they reach age five, and they are never registered in more in these uh, developing countries. So you underestimate child mortality, right? Because you don't have, you don't properly count the number of children that were born and died before reaching age five. The same kind of problem of under reporting happens in terms of that. Only 25% of the world population lives in countries with 90% or more of deaths being registered. And it's actually really good in more developed countries, but it still have a lot of developing countries that do not report that data. So whenever you try to analyze data from that was collected, data that were collected with birth or death uh, certificates, you have to know, you have to be concerned about the accuracy of that data because it can be some underreporting. Vital records, how they are usually collected, who is the legal authority to collect that data. Vital records were responsibilities of the clergy in, this, in 17th century England. And this practice was followed by English colonies in North America. Here in the US, individual states are now the legal authorities, and all US states had birth and death records collected by 1919. And the US registration areas were established 
1900 for death registration area, 1950, 1915 for birth, 1957 for marriages, and 1958 for divorces. So all of these US registration areas were collected. And the way that happens is the states collect this information about uh, death, birth, marriage, and divorces, and then they send them to uh, these national registration areas. So birth and death data are sent by the states to the national centers for health statistics. And then they compile this data and we can finally access them at the aggregate level, okay? This is a specific case of the US. Birth certificates, which kind of data it has there? It has the names and ages of parents, their occupations, and sometimes the level of education as well. And it's usually filled out by the physician, midwife, mother, or father. For example, my children, they were born in LA, in, in Santa Monica, and in the room where uh, uh, we were after birth, I received this form from the hospital to fill out information about uh, both babies, like the twin babies. And that information gets sent to the state and afterwards the state, in that case, the state of California, sends it to the national registration area, okay? Death certificates has information about the age, in which the person died, occupation, place of death, and cause of death. And it is usually filled out by funeral, uh, funeral homes with personal in, uh, information about the descendants provided by surviving family members, physician, or coroner. So usually family members of the physician provide that kind of information to, to be included in the death certificates. And as demographers are always concerned we have to know exactly what is death. How do you measure death in each specific time of life? What are considered fetal deaths, miscarriages, abortions, stillbirths, deaths and births? What is birth? What is death? All right, so all these this concepts it's really important to have them really well detailed. So we collect this information in a more systematic and standardized way across states and across countries. So fetal death is the disappearance of life prior to life birth, which includes miscarriages, abortions, and stillbirths. So miscarriages is a spontaneous or accidental termination of fetal life that occurs early in pregnancy. Abortions, the premature expulsion of a fetus, spontaneous or induced at a time before it is viable of sustaining life. And it still bars late fetal death of 20 to 28 weeks or more of gestation, right? We are trying to be scientists here. And these terms really matter. I have seen the de debates, for example, in the uh, presidential debate in the 2016 election, in which the previous president was mentioning, oh, people are performing abortions right at the time of birth. That's completely wrong. If a woman is right at the end of her pregnancy and then with a C-section or whatever, the baby comes out, but it's dead, it's not an abortion, it's a stillbirth. And that's really important. Of course, that kind of debate, the political debate, people don't really discuss that that much, but it's important for us who have access to more refined information, who have access to read a textbook about demographic terms, to be more concerned to properly use these terms, right? In that specific case, that was not 
an example of abortion. That was an example of stillbirth. And what exactly is death? It's the permanent disappearance of all evidence of life at any time after a live birth has taken place. Birth, extraction from its mother of a product of conception which breathes or shows any evidence of life. Right? It has to be really specific, really clear. And abortions in the US are allowed up to the, to the third month of pregnancy, exactly because based on scientific data up to that point, you don't have, uh, the fetus is not developing in a way that's supposed to, have, to be a form of real life, a life as human beings. And after that specific moment, abortions are not allowed, just in specific cases when there is already uh, an issue uh, with the fetus or with the baby or with the mother, okay? And I do understand that this issue is really controversial in this university, for example, that I see a lot of anti-abortion uh, groups around the, the university. And, but, and I do stop sometimes to talk to them about that. And I just bring scientific information to explain all these different terms. And usually those people don't have that information. So I'm just going there not to change anybody's mind. It's just to say, you should study more. And that's our goal here at the university, right? What's the diff what are some uh, differences between censuses and registration systems as we discussed in this lecture so far? Census, we collect data for a specific time period, so it's cross-sectional, and we get information about the size, composition, and distribution of the population. Registration systems or registration events are captured as they happen. Every day people are being born, Every day people are dying. So we usually count births and deaths in a continuous way. So the census is uh, static in the sense that we're collecting data for a specific time period and registration systems are dyna dynamic and continuous. In the US, the federal government is, uh, the Census Bureau is the one who conducts the census and the state governments are in charge to collect demographic events related to births, deaths, a marriage, a divorce, as we mentioned before. And then the state governments send them to federal government. And both of them are the place of residence is the usual place of residence. It's not the place of residence where the person was at that day that the interviewer asked the question. So both of them are de jure in the sense that the residence of the person is the residence of usual residence, not the residence at that time of answering the questionnaire. And the final form that we're gonna discuss here of collecting data, demographic data, comes from samples, right, surveys. And the idea is that collecting data for everybody in the population, such as the census, is really expensive, time consuming, expensive. So what social scientists do, they pretty much have to collect data for smaller groups of the population, for samples of the population, and try to understand the whole population with those few people that answer the question. So we have to have a really good sample design in a way that the people who answer my questionnaire, the average information that they give me can, is representative to the whole population, is the average information of the whole population. So I have to collect proportionally in my sample the same amount of men and women 
children, adults, and older people, people by race, ethnicity. Proportionally, I have to get people from all these different subgroups that are important for us in the same proportion as the population. And then when we analyze this data, we're gonna say, I have a sample, a subgroup of the population, but I did such a good survey design that that sample is representative to my whole population. So I can use this data from few people to understand a whole group of people. So inferential statistics use data from samples to make generalizations about populations. Again, concepts matter. So what is population? It's the total collection of all cases in which the research is interested. Samples are carefully chosen subsets of the population. Why carefully? In a way that information of that small group of people is representative to the whole population so I can make generalizations. So when I have those election polls that are really, we all hear about them in election years, that you just interview 1,000, 2,000 people, ask them which candidate they will vote, and then you say, oh, the chances of specific candidate A getting, uh, candidate A, we expect that candidate to get 40% of the votes, and candidate B get 60% of the votes. But whenever we are doing these extrapolations, these inferences from samples in two population, we have to use proper techniques. The generalizations are based on samples that can represent populations. So in my example here, I said that in a sample, I got 40% of people saying that they will vote for candidate a in 60% to candidate B. But this is not data for the whole population. It's a sample. I'm doing an inference from a sample to a population. So a major technique that we use is to calculate the margin of error. So I will say that candidate is expected to get 40% with a margin of error of, let's say, plus or minus 5%. So I'm saying it's 40% on average, but it can be something in between 35 and 45%. And the candidate that got 60 can be something between 55 and 65%, right? Whenever we, are, we use this margin of errors is because we are using samples to make inferences about population. We can make mistakes, and that's what we try to uh, estimate with the margins of error, okay? So information from samples is used to estimate information about the population. And just to be clear, my example, candidate A got 40% of the uh, preference from my sample. Candidate B, 60%. This 40 and this 60%, are called statistic. They are characteristics of my samples. But I use these statistics in order to estimate my parameters. What is the parameter? Is the characteristics of the population. Do I have the parameter in this example? No. I have only the statistic. And I know that's not going to be exactly the same as the parameter after election day and we count the votes. So that's why the statistic, characteristic of the sample, I have a chance of making a mistake, I use the margin of error. And then I say that my statistic can bounce between candidate A between 35 and 45%, and I have a specific chance that my, uh, this interval will contain the true parameter. Right? So what we are doing, and that is all we discuss in, in statistics classes. This is an introduction. So these slides here are not in the textbook. I just use it from my other class 
which is a class on introduction to statistics to sociology students. Just we start then what is discussed in our textbook. All right, so surveys, the idea is that we don't want to know just age, sex, race, ethnicity, um, composition of the household, and whether households are rented or not. We want to know more about populations, but it's expensive to do censuses with really detailed questionnaires. So we have samples. And we usually do those with exact surveys because we want to collect more detailed demographic information that's not contained in decennial census, demographic census, or registration systems. And the surveys, since we're going to interview fewer people, we can ask more questions and get extensive kinds of information available uh, in those specific uh, surveys. Some examples of surveys I'm going to show you here is, for example, the demographic and health surveys or also uh, called DHS. I mean, usually outside of demography, when you say DHS, you think about Department of Homeland Security. Among demographers, DHS means demographic and health service. <laughs> okay. And I first realized that in my previous job at the Rand Corporation, where we were few demographers and a bunch of people doing work about the military. Then I understood that DHS was not what I used to to think about. But the DHS is here. There are 260 sample surveys in 90 developing countries implemented since 1984 every five years. So you have this long questionnaire, this long survey that's collected in all these developing countries. I don't have time and money to interview everybody in those countries, I get samples. Why developing countries? Because usually developing countries, they don't have money by themselves to collect this refined information about demography and health. So international organizations came together and they give money to developing countries to collect that information. In Brazil, for example, we collected in 86 and 96, but then in 2006, Brazil was not considered a developing country anymore by those institutions. So the Brazilian government itself had to implement that survey in 2006. But usually more developing countries, they still get these resources to implement the demographic and health service. And the information, it's really detailed information about fertility, population, health, and nutrition. It, they really go into the households, measure the size of the kids, weigh them with a scale. It's really, really refined, refined data that's collected in those surveys. And there are also interim surveys between DHS rounds that collect less information and provide demographic information previously unknown about developing countries, right? So we can know information about average number of children that women are having, total fertility rate, contraceptive use, child mortality, which is data that usually we don't have available from those countries because the government uh, is not well organized or have enough resources to implement these more refined surveys. Some examples of fertility surveys, the World Fertility Survey, WFS, was a coordinated cross national survey between 74 and 86. And it collected information on reproductive behavior and related social and psychological indicators in 62 countries. Might sound not so representative, but the 62 countries represented 40% of the world's population at, the, at those years. Some other fertility surveys can focus on, on specific groups of countries or, or one country like 
European Fertility Project, and Service of Family and Reproductive Behavior in Puerto Rico and Mexico. Mexico is amazing in terms of data collection. Mexico has really refined um, questionnaire for the census. The long questionnaire in the census, they collect information about, uh, similar to what ACS does, but also collect information even about immigration, not just immigration or internal migration. The Mexico government, since the 70s, has this family planning program that they provide contraceptive methods to rural communities for free. So in those poor communities, women have access to contraceptive methods. So they have this really, really often uh, surveys are implemented to measure uh, fertility, family and reproductive behavior in all over Mexico. And then you can estimate total fertility rate and contraceptive use for specific areas in Mexico as well. So it's pretty much showing that they implemented the family planning program since the 70s and they collect data regularly to measure whether that specific policy is attaining the population or not. I, I have a paper that I compared Brazil and Mexico because Brazil didn't have actually family planning program uh, my paper is, I used it only until 2000 at that time that it was available. More recently, after 2010, we started having some specific programs, but not with the data that I analyzed. So I compare Mexico and, and Brazilian data, and the Mexican data is amazing. Now available for free uh, by, I think it's INERI. Uh, Instituto Nacional de Estatística e Geografia. National Institute of Geography and, and Statistics. Some surveys in the US, the American Community Survey that I mentioned to you here before. The census is implemented every 10 years in a short questionnaire. Until the, 20, the 2000 census, we also had a long form that was implementing a sample of the population. After that, and starting 2005, the long form became the American Community Survey. So the American Community Survey collects data, this long form, they should be part of the census now every year. The current population survey focuses more on information about the labor market, but it has a lot of good information for demographers as well and, and all other social scientists. And it's collected every month. So you can, the latest American Community Survey available is from 2019. The latest current population survey available is from January, 2021. Only two months ago, we already have data about from the current population survey. In the current population survey, you can analyze data per month, but you also have the release of information, kind of like a, an average, a summary for the whole year. They can do the analysis of CPS per year as well. We also have the National Service of Family Growth and then National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent and Adult Health in the US. In these two cases, these are longitudinal surveys in the sense that they follow people over time. Okay. Just uh, to go a little bit more in detail about those surveys, the ACS is a redesign, it was redesigned from census long form questionnaire to be a continuous measurement survey in the late 19, uh, 1990s. But actually, it started being implemented in a more systematic way, nationally representative in 2005. Like I said before, to the 2000 census, you had the short form, the short questionnaire. You'd ask to everybody, the census, and the long questionnaire, just a sample to the whole population. It was part of the census, but it was actually a sample, not a census. It didn't count everybody. And it started in the 2010 census and now in the 2020, only the short form is implemented, and the long form since 2005 is implemented 
in, every year in all counties in the US and also in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, you actually can, you download, usually you get information separated. So that's called the Puerto Rican Community Survey, PRCS. In the sample of the ACS, communities with 65,000 or more people receive uh, data estimates every year since 2006. Smaller communities, since you don't have a big sample size for smaller communities, those between 20,000 and 65,000 people, you have to put three years together. In ACS, we call those three year estimates. So every three years, you get the average information about those uh, medium sized communities. And for communities with less than 20,000 people, you have to get data for five years in sequence and get them all together to analyze as an average for that uh, five year period. Just to give you an idea, the ACS sample has around 3.5 million households being interviewed. And when you go to the household, you ask questions about the household, but then the person who is giving you information gives information about everybody in that household. Age, sex, race, ethnicity, and so on. About everybody there. And the sample size is kind of similar, even in more recent years. The current population survey, as I mentioned, is uh, collected per month. And, and is sponsored by the U.S. Census. Uh, yeah, U.S. Census Bureau, U.S. Bureau of Census, and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics focus more on labor force data about the civilian non-institutional population. So it's people outside of uh, prisons and outside of um, elderly communities as well. And it does not collect information about children. The sample is for people with at least 14 years of age in around 60,000 households. You see, the CPS allow you to analyze data every month, but we don't collect information for 3.5 million households as ACS, for fewer households. So you cannot break down your survey for small communities. Usually when you do analysis about CPS, you are analyzing regions in the US, groups of states. You don't do analysis at the sub-state uh, level. ACS, you can do that. It collects basic labor force questions, but also census type questions. And in some years you have extra questions being asked as well. The National Survey of Family Growth, National Representative Multi-State Survey, is conducted on a simple uh, continuous basis. Uh, a sample of males and female respondents between the ages of 15 and 44. Focus more information on family life, marriage, divorce, pregnancy, infertility, contraception, men's and women's health. And because it has more um, sensible, sensitive information, it is conducted with uh, the help of the audio computer assisted self interviewing. So, because of the sensitive topics related to sexuality, it's all done uh, by computer, not like someone asked the question in those households. The Ed Health started by Professor Woodry, and it's really longitudinal, and it started with adolescents that were in grade seven to twelve in the U.S in 1994 and 1995. And they follow the same people over time. So for example, they had like four follow-up interviews up to 2008 with those same people that back then in 1994, 1996 were on seventh and 12th grade, okay? So let me just, I think we still have some time here. So I gave you an overview about censuses, registration systems, and surveys. 
And remember, census that's when we count the whole population. Surveys, we select subgroups of the population, but they are representative to the whole population, so we can understand it. And registration systems is the information that's not so refined. We don't have so many variables in our database, but it's collected on a continuous basis. Okay, and so in the, the census up to 2000, it had the short form, which is really a census collected to the whole population. And the long form, although it was called the long form of the 2000 census, it was not actually a census. It was a, a sample, a sample of the population with a more refined uh, questionnaire. Starting in 2005, we have the ACS taking care of that long form, okay? So this, I showed to you the, the file from the UN. And here, at the end of our course website, after all the lectures and everything, I put here some websites where I usually collect information, for example, about the pandemic. Those graphs and tables that I showed to you here, I just go to these websites here. So here are some of them. The US Census Bureau has several uh, portals where you can collect data. This data.census.gov is a new initiative of the Census Bureau and it compiles everything, all this, they try to compile everything in the same website and it, it works like Google. You search by topic and it gives you the tables that they have available, public available on that topic. But see here, several other sub, uh, other websites in the Census Bureau. The demographic and health surveys, the data can be accessible here. This population pyramids is one uh, website that I also usually use for classes about changes in age structure, because we can have these population pyramids download in a really easy way for several countries in several years. The, United Nations also has the population division data. It's very interesting. This, this website here I'm gonna show you, I just think it's funny. I mean, it's, it's cool that it gives really simple information about demography in a really easy way to understand it, population.io. And this other website here also shows migration flows between countries in, in a map, a single map for the whole world. So those, and yeah, I mean, so it's really a lot of information here. The Gap Minder is that institute was founded by Hans Rosling. And I, I already put some videos up in our website. I took it from here. World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the UN that I showed up there also has all interesting data. The Pew Research uh, Center data, the Pew Research Center, has a lot of interesting articles being written about the American society and also about the world. And they collect their own surveys and they provide information about those surveys in their website as well. Brookings Institute also has really interesting articles related to demography. Academic associations in this case, sources for literature review. If you are doing a literature review, what you should do, you get a paper and you look at the reference of that paper and you see which articles that specific paper cited. With Web of Science, you can do the opposite. If you have a paper that you know that's really important in your area and you wanna know who cited that paper after it was published, you can go to Web of Science. That's really good to do uh, work in academia. And if you are logged into the computer, at the a &M network, you can access the Web of Science and JSTOR as well. But the Web of Science, I like it because of that. It tells you who cited that paper that you have interest. And so, and these public opinion polls, those uh, sites that are, that I, I wanna show you, 
I click here and they appear in purple instead of these ones here, are the ones that I were just quickly showing in these last five minutes. This uh, website, Our World in Data. If you click here, Our World in Data, you get to here and the Data Explorer. If you click there, you get into this site here and you can select specific countries in order to see the trends of the current pandemic. And this data here is based on rate. It's confirmed cases per million people. You can have also the total population that had the, the virus. Or you can have the rate or the death rate, right? So Brazil is a really bad place now. Other countries, the death rates tend to be declining right now, like the, the US is one of the cases. But Brazil, the death rate, even considering the size of the population is increasing. You can have this information in log, so you know whether the curve is flattening or not. But as I mentioned before, if you look in the case of the US, let me just, just show the US here. Although it's declining, the level now is even higher than it was in last fall and last summer. And at that time, we were worried about keep wearing masks and everything, right? And I showed this data to you for taxes in the last class. This other one here, Wordometer, it gives this main table of countries. Here, I just, I just click here to show countries by total number of deaths. Italy just passed 100,000 deaths, becoming the sixth country in the world with uh, more than 100,000 deaths. The US the highest, Brazil, and in terms of uh, rates, you can also do it here. Of course, some countries with really few deaths but a small population, you have really high death rates. So usually I, I link from here, I order sort from here, and then I compare the death rates of these countries that have the highest numbers of deaths. So the US and no, I did for new deaths, total deaths. The US has a higher death rate and Italy as well, among those countries that reach at least 100,000 deaths. So simple table, this table I usually use in my slides and you have seen them in my lectures. This other one by the New York Times. The New York Times is interesting because it has information about the world, the US, but also by state. So I click on the US and we can go for by states here. Let me just, and that's where I got the information specifically for, sorry, specifically for taxes. You can click on the graph by the state. Uh, let me see if they have this one here. For Texas, you have the cases, and down there, you're going to have the cases and the death together. Exactly what I was saying. Going down and now actually going up, and the level right now, higher than last fall and higher than the last summer. The other one, the next one here is the, the Census Bureau. So here pretty much you can search as you do in Google, fertility, let's say fertility taxes. And you get all these different tables here. And it says where the data is from, American Community Survey, the years, and then you can click on it and it's gonna give you the data, okay? And this is all public available public available data. And that's the data from, from Texas. Um, and this is births in the past 12 months by marital status and by age as well. This other one here is that population pyramid that I mentioned. You, um, you have information about the, you can select a specific country 
let's get Mexico, for example. And you can get this information for uh, 1975. You can go to 2020, how it is now, how it's projected to be in 2100, right? So it really changed in population. And that's just, and you can download this from the source for any one of the countries here in alphabetical order. The population IO was just something interesting that I thought, I know that's already 430, it's not working here now, but this is the uh, map for population flows. And if I click, for example, here in the US, I know all the flows of countries that are going to the US and I have an idea of how many people are going by going up here. And here it tells you that this data is from between 2010 and 2015, depending on the country. The US gaining annually 3 million people and uh, they Mexico sending 780,000 people to the US. And this final one here was just a, Interesting thing, you can put your, your birthday. Let's so just do mine here. Country of birth. I can put, I can play with country of birth or country of residence. And then it's gonna show you that I'm on the 68th percentile. So there are, I'm older than 68% of the population in the world and only 32 older than me. It tells me how many years I have left. Not so many. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I really think this website is funny, right? And you can play with that. And I mean, just put your birthday, US, in, in, in your gender. And then you can see it's really interesting data here. Cool. Well, so, all those websites, of course, each one of them you have to learn, it takes a while but it's just to show that you have all this public available data. And for example, that web of science, you have to be at the university wireless, but you have all that opportunity to access that data being at a and And a lot of those also, if you're not at the university as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I see you guys on Thursday. Yeah, thank you.